It is tempting to say I want to pull the faculty rank from the faculty table in the drop down. No. That limits your choice. Yeah, that limits your choices. I want to pull the list of all the possible faculty ranks. Where, where is the list of all the possible faculty ranks? It's in the faculty rank table. So therefore my select is going to select those two columns from the faculty rank table. Put differently, and, and I see this a lot, you know, uh, or I, you know I, I see people making this mistake a lot. They'll think, well, hey, I'm dealing with a faculty table here, so I want to pull a list of faculty ranks from the faculty table. Then I see 500 faculty ranks in a drop-down, right? One for each faculty member. I don't want to see all the faculty members' faculty ranks. I just want to see the list of faculty ranks that are available. And that data is contained in the faculty rank table. So, now I want to go in and I want to make that faculty rank a drop-down instead of a text box. So, I'll go here. Edit fields. Bind that to the alert. Right. First we make it a template column. All right. Why do we make it a template column? What does that mean to make it a template column? So we can put validation in it. Right. Uh, so we can put validation in it. Uh, that, that's part of it. That's one possibility. Um, really, the more complete statement is, is I don't want this column handled in the default manner. Now, what's the default manner? The default manner is that when you're in view mode, you view it in a label. When you are in edit mode, you have a text box. I don't want a text box when I'm in edit mode. I want a drop down when I'm in edit mode. All right? Therefore, I need to make it a template column because I don't want the default behavior. I don't want there simply to be uh, a drop down uh, or a text box. I want there to be a drop down instead. So I convert it to a template column. Then I can go in and edit templates. Oh, I think I forgot to actually click to make it a template column. There you go. Convert it to a template column. Now we can choose that template for faculty rank. And I can set any of these things to be different than what the default behavior is. So to start out, I'm going to go and simply get rid of the edit item template and add, get, get rid of the text box in that and add a drop down in there instead. Now that drop down, where is it going to get its data from? From that data source 2. What do I want to display in the drop down? I want to display the description. And what value do I want to pull from that? I want to pull the Frank, F rank. Edit data bindings. I want to bind the value of this drop down to the faculty rank field in the faculty table. It's important to select those bindings, because otherwise, without that, let's not do this. Let's say we forgot to do this step. All right, let's show you what happens. I'll go in. did was handle the visual, and even that I didn't do particularly well. Actually, that wasn't what I was expected, but expecting, but it, it was another issue. All right. At any rate, I want to go and put the bindings in, and I want to bind that to the faculty rank field in the faculty rank table. Let's go and run this now. I go to edit. Whoa. Still got that problem.
So enable this application, move the app offline HTML file from the application root. That's a new one on me. Well, not really. You just don't see it very often. App online, I'll get rid of that. If I forget to bind it, I can go and I can pick a new value. That's weird. And it does make the change. This is, uh, I'm breaking it when I don't want to and not breaking it when I do want to. <laughs> Well, well, we'll we'll set it back to the way we know it should be. We'll bind it to the faculty rank, and hopefully that will work. Something like this happens, it pays to refresh the schema of the <coughs> data source. There we go. And we're back to working. All right. The key points to remember, I don't want you to get caught up in my attempts to show you what goes wrong or what could go wrong is that when you create a drop-down like this, number one, your data source should access the table that contains a list of the values you want to display in a drop-down. So in this case, I want to display all the faculty ranks, so I will, my select will be from the faculty rank table. And that's what my select is in SQL Data Source 2. I then convert the edit field for that into, uh, or I convert that column to a template column. So I convert faculty rank to a template column. I replace the text box with a drop down, bind that drop down to my data source. So I choose a data source and then I specify where the value from that drop down goes. And in this case it goes to the faculty rank table. I'm sorry, it goes to the faculty rank field in the faculty table. Okay. Now, when we go and run this, you'll notice that it still comes up with the code here. It'd be nice if it showed the actual value of that as opposed to this code. Here's what we can do. I've already made that into a template column. So therefore, I can remove the item template, the label, and I can put another drop down here. And I can choose a data source, which is data source 2. Display the description. The value is the faculty rank. Edit data bindings. Bind this to the faculty rank, just like before. But then I can go into the properties of this, of this drop-down and I can specify that it's not enabled. What that will allow me is 
is when I'm in read-only view, I can't change it. Only when I go into edit view can I go in and change it, if that's what I want. So that's how I handle the multiple table thing. Like getting back to your example, I would do that for the service ID. Because in my service history table, the service ID is coming from a list of services in the service table. And then I make drop downs there and disable the one that is in the item view. Questions about any of this? All right. Notice something. Notice that when I click on update, oh, I'm sorry. When I click on the key, it brings me to this read-only mode. All right? To actually edit, I have to click edit. And then I go into edit mode. Now, depending on your preference, you may not like the way that that behaves. That's an extra click if you want to edit that. All right? You might want it so that as soon as you click that link, it automatically goes into edit mode. All right? You might want it to do this, especially if they can edit or delete. But in this case, all they can do is edit. So it would be nice if they could just pop into edit mode. Okay? So how can we do that? If we look, associated with the details view, Associated with the details view is somewhere over here, a default mode. And the default mode is set currently to read only. Your choices for the default mode are at, uh, read only, which is what we were doing here, or edit, or insert. So if I change that to edit mode, for the default mode, that sort of eliminates that middle step. All right. In other words, if I click this link, it'll immediately go into edit mode. All right. And I can edit this and update it. Without having to click the extra button to edit it. That's what I want you to do for your assignment. I want to go right into edit mode. So you'll set that mode to, to uh, edit mode. Now, a couple other things that you might notice. Now that we're doing that, when I go and save this, when I go and update it, it simply redisplays that edit screen again. Is that what I want? No. What should I? What do I probably want to do? Go back to that. Go back to that grid. All right. So, where do you suppose we'll put code to do this? We've been here before. <laughs> All right. Where do you suppose we'll put code in to do this? Put a link. Pardon me. Put a link up to the home page. Well, I could put a link, but then I'd have to click on it. Wouldn't it be nice if instead, if, I, if my update was successful, it would automatically go to that other page? The SDX file. Pardon me? The code behind. And we'll put it in the code behind file. In what event? Get the uh, update click. Event? Update completed. Yeah. Update completed. It, well, it would be in the item updated event. Remember, we have, uh, for each action, we have a, a present tense and a past tense event. The present tense event means it's going on now. You're in the middle of it. You're actually about to do it. And in the past tense event, we've done it. And at that point, we can put our error catching to find out if anything went wrong. And we can also put in our um, redirection if the update did go correctly. 
So for example, if I go in and I try to save this person without a name, I get an ugly error. We don't want that, right? We want it so that when we update it, if it's not successful, it displays a user-friendly error. If it is successful, we return back to the grid. So we have two possibilities of what we want to do after the item has been updated. All right? So we can put that code in the item updated event. So I'll double click here. And I'll go and look and say for the details view, item updated. All right? So here's where we can handle actually both scenarios. If the update went correctly, we can put code in to um, redirect to um, the, the grid. If it did not go correctly, we can put air trapping code. What I'm going to do, first off, so I'm going to put a text box up here, or a label rather, that will allow me to put my air message. in case something went wrong. All right. So, what do we test here? How do we know if it worked or went wrong? Pardon me? The E object is where we're ultimately going to find what we're looking for. The E object, if you remember, is the event parameters. So the E object will actually tell us everything that happened. So, E dot exception, that object either exists or doesn't exist. If it exists, that means that there's an error. If it doesn't exist, it means everything went okay. So, if I ask if E exception is nothing, then what do I want to do? Display the label. If it is nothing, no, you want to I want to redirect. Remember, previously oh, okay. I was saying if not is nothing. Now I'm asking okay. if it is nothing. So if it is nothing, then I've had success. Otherwise, I've had failure. So, I'll go and I will write the comments correctly using VB's unique syntax, as opposed to every other language's syntax for comments. But if it's successful, I want to go back to that page. How do I do that? Well, there's two objects in almost any server-side web development platform, and they're usually called the same thing. So they're the same thing in PHP and, and other languages. There's a request and a response. The request handles stuff that comes from the browser to the server, right? Because the, the browser or the client is making a request of the server. <laughs> The response deals with the server doing something to the client, right? So client sending something to the server is a request. Server sending something back to the client is a response. So which of those two objects do you think will be the code to send the browser to a different page? Response, response right? Because that goes from the server to the client. So response dot. There's actually a response.redirect, and I can send it to the name of the page that I want to send that, um, that to if it's successful. Is that a dot .aspx at the end of that? Yeah. With the page, the full name? Okay. Yeah, it's just the name of the page. Where do I want to send it to? I want to send it to faculty-maintenance.aspx, so that's what I put in here. <coughs> Otherwise, if there's an error, what do I want to do? Well, I want to set my label. <coughs> and 
And then I want to tell the parameters that I got this one. So I say exception handled equals true. So that's pretty standard what we've done before. All right. The if statement is written a little backwards. All right, because now we're doing something if it's okay or if there's an error. But if there's an error, we're redirecting, or I'm sorry, if there's an error we're not redirecting, we are setting the value of that label to some user-friendly code. And then we're telling the .NET framework, we handled this. You don't need to handle it. Remember, someone has to clean up this mess. All right, someone has to handle the exceptions. It's either going to be us or it's going to be the, the framework. If we handle the exception, we have to tell the framework, hey, we took care of it. All right? And that's what we do with this line. So now if I run this, I go in, I edit, I change this person to an assistant professor, uh, I click update, and it goes back to the grid. Or I go in and change John Blanchard to John Blanchard, click update, it's made. On the other hand, if I go and give something erroneous, like no last name or no first name, I get my user-friendly error message, uh, and I'm good to go. All right. So this is just the ability to maintain the existing. This is not the ability to add anybody. Right. This, this is just updates. Um, deletions would be handled just like we did on the grid view. So I'm not going to go over that, but essentially it would be identical. We have yet to talk about inserts. And today we will probably talk about the sequel for inserts, but um, I don't know if we'll have a chance to, to do it or not. We might. We'll, we'll have to see. All right. Okay, questions. All right. The insert statement in SQL. First of all, you can duplicate all your notes about what could go wrong with an insert statement. Duplicate all your notes from what could go wrong with an update statement. Because everything we said that could go wrong with an update statement can go wrong with an insert statement, right? Missing columns that are required, invalid foreign keys, duplicate keys, mismatch of data types, blah, 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 blah. And, in fact, all the things that we said that we would do to fix those things for an update, we can fix those things with an insert. So all that stuff remains the same. And in addition, all right, um, and in addition, um, <coughs> holding off my train of thought, um, I don't know, we'll come back to that if, if, if I remember. It's going to bug me now. All the things that we could do to fix it will fix it. We have the same kind of errors. Yeah. <laughs> Got me. What do insert statements look like? There's actually several forms of the, imp uh, of the, of the uh, insert statement. We'll talk about the one form that we're going to use in this class. All right? And I guess we don't need to talk about the other forms. The one form is not really good on a recurring basis because you don't list the column names. That's dangerous because if someone adds a column to the table, your insert stops working. All right, that's one. The other is to do an insert from a select, and that's an intriguing thing. And where it's particularly useful is if you're converting data. If you're converting data from a flat file to a SQL file, you can import that flat file into a database table and then do inserts from selects to populate your other tables. So that's kind of nifty, all right? Um, and believe me, that's a project almost everyone does at some point, is to take stuff from Excel and make a relational database out of it. And when you do that, just, just make a note to yourself to Google insert from select. And, and that will help you out a lot. But the form of the insert statement we're going to 
address is this one, where it looks like this. Insert into table, all right, a list of the columns that you're inserting into, values, then a list of the values that you have. Now, I guess another thing could go wrong, right? If you don't match the number of columns and values, you could get an error. If you specify four columns and only three values, you'll get an error, all right? So that's, that's one other thing that could go wrong. The values in the columns simply match up in sequence. And the value needs to be of a correct data type. So for example, if the value was a number, you just put in the number. If the value was a string, you'd put in the string. You can only insert into one table, just like you can only update or delete from one table. About all the things that could go wrong with an update could go wrong with an insert. Yeah. yeah. If, uh, say you've got all these tables here and you're going to insert into one, mm -hmm. that's going to leave orphan data in the other tables, isn't it? How would inserting the one table leave orphan data in the other? really orphan then, yeah. right? If you insert a faculty member but then didn't add any classes for them, okay, fine. There's a faculty person that doesn't teach any classes. Orphan data would be where you had a class that didn't match up with a faculty person. All right? So, you know, it only goes in one direction. It's okay to have faculty people that aren't assigned classes. It's not okay to have a class that's not assigned to faculty person. You do not have to list all the columns in the table when you're doing an insert. All right? So that won't necessarily be every column in the table. Um, you better be inserting into the columns that are required, however. So if, you know, a column is required and it's not included in your insert statement, you know, it won't work. You'll get an error because um, it'll, it'll get a null value, and if null values are not allowed, then it's going to blow up. If it's an auto number and the insert fails, I don't believe the auto, the, the auto number gets incremented. That's a good question. You're saying if there's an error? Well, if you're um, if you're inserting uh -huh. a new faculty member, right? Do you have to include the oh, okay. key? Oh, okay. All right. Good. Good question. I misunderstood your question. The answer is no. 